going to, as mentioned, to talk about psychopathology of suicidal and aggressive behaviors. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So lecture today uh, will be uh, structured uh, that in this way that I will first talk about interrelationship between suicidal and violent behavior, mostly on the basis of epidemiological studies. Then I will uh, mention endophenotypes of suicidal behavior uh, and uh, go further to uh, discuss about the value of measuring interpersonal violence in suicidal patients. And finally, I will very shortly mention some neurobiological underpinnings uh, of these uh, behaviors. So, suicide as an aggressive act, the idea is not new. Already uh, Sigmund Freud, Freud presented in that way that uh, suicide can be see, seen kind of an aggressive act uh, directed uh, towards the own person. It can be illustrated by this drawing of an Umeå psychiatrist. Uh, I think this picture captures these both behaviors in a, in a quite a clever way that they are indeed, to some extent at least, interconnected. So, both the, uh, these behaviors are very complex and uh, can be classified in several ways. This uh, schema on uh, violence uh, from the Lancet paper shows one way of uh, uh, characterizing violence. And uh, I have first highlighted their violence as an interpersonal violence type, which can be directed to family or partner or uh, to a stranger. And there is also collective violence, which can be uh, subdivided further to social, political, or economic. And on the left-hand side, there is a self-inflicted violence where suicidal behavior is uh, an important uh, uh, part of this self-inflicted violence. Uh, you can also divide the violence according to the nature of violence, which is shown uh, down with different colors on this uh, picture. Uh, you can uh, talk about physical violence, sexual violence, even psychological violence and deprivation. In this talk, I'm going to uh, mainly uh, focus on interpersonal violence and uh, violence as a behavior and uh, suicidal behavior. So in psych psychiatry or in uh, different diagnosis, the aggression is uh, different concerning what, uh, what kind of uh, diagnosis or problems you, the patient can have. It can be reactive ag aggression, as in borderline personality disorder, related to emotional dysregulation, or it can be more like instrumental aggression in antisocial personality disorder, and this is related to some extent to psychopathy. Uh, 
And then if you have cognitive impairments, like um, aggression in psychosis and deviant behaviors, uh, which uh, Sheila, Professor Sheila Hodgson is going to talk about later, and uh, also the trauma history uh, plays a role, uh, especially in aggression triggered by trauma in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So, why are these uh, two uh, behaviors interconnected? Uh, we have made a few years ago a study on suicide risk in individuals who have killed another person. We followed up a cohort of 167 persons who had committed homicide between 1970 till 1980, and they were followed up at least 22 years. This cohort comes from northern Sweden. During the follow-up, 29 uh, persons had committed suicide, and their cumulative suicide risk was 18.6 when we did the survival analysis. And as you can see, the suicide risk from this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve was very high during the ver first year of the follow-up, but the suicides continued to rise during the whole follow-up, even the um, suicide rates were not as uh, remarkably high as in the beginning of the uh, follow-up period. This is another example of, uh, of uh, special population um, and suicide risk. This study, uh, which we published two years ago, uh, shows suicide risk after release from prison in Sweden. And um, there were 39,000 releases during 2005-2009 and uh, 127 uh, uh, released prisoners committed suicide during the follow-up period. And when we compared the suicide risk with the risk of general population, we found that uh, it was 18.2. And as you can see, the first year here also is a high-risk period. It's the period just after the release from prison. So again, in a very sp special population with, which had been sentenced to prison and committed uh, part of them at least uh, violent crimes, uh, the suicide risk is higher, much higher than in the general population. What about in the general population? We have also made a study about uh, uh, Swedish men who conscripted uh, uh, 1969, 1970. They were 50,000 about, and they were assessed at the uh, conscription uh, for psychiatric diagnosis. Also, there were measures of social uh, maturity, emotional control. We had also information about uh, early risk factors prior uh, conscription, like conduct problems at school, uh, contact with the police or juvenile authorities, and uh, different kind of substance abuse. And during the follow-up, we uh, connected all these 50,000 individuals to Swedish national registers and uh, from the crime register we could detect all the men who had uh, committed violent crimes. We had also during that adult period information about their psychiatric diagnosis or substance abuse diagnosis if they had been in inpatient care. And we followed up them uh, till 2004 and until death. What we found uh, concerning the suicide risk in men who had made, committed violent crimes, the, if you had committed one violent crime, you still had a, a hazard ratio of 1.55, but if you had committed two or more violent offenses, the hazard was even higher, 2.39. And these, um, Hazards were adjusted for uh, variables like psychiatric diagnosis at conscription, emotional control, social maturity, even the early factors, which are strong predictors like contact with police and um, smoking, problem drinking, drug misuse. 
So, this is another example of uh, this connection. This study is from uh, New Zealand, and uh, it's a long-term follow-up of uh, a population-based cohort. And here they studied uh, persons who had uh, made a suicide attempt when they were young, and they were assessed at the age of 38. And what you can see, the suicide attempt in young people is a signal for long-term health care and social needs in the way that they have a, a worse uh, psy uh, psychiatric health, of course, but also somatic health in form of metabolic uh, syndrome risk, and they were more often convicted for violent crime. So early age of suicide attempt is a marker of a worse outcome and uh, a signal for long-term healthcare needs. So what about this phenotype? In this uh, review paper, Gustavo Turecki from Canada, uh, defined the role of uh, impulsive aggressive behaviors in suicide phenotype. Suicidal behavior is, as I mentioned, very complex. Uh, you can start to see the uh, individual risk factors, which are here, the green boxes, and uh, there are, of course, the distal risk factors like genetics and family history, which uh, are important, as well as early life adversity, which can lead to epigenetic changes. And these, these uh, early predisposing factors can lead to developmental factors like high impulsive aggression, but also high anxiety, or to cognitive deficits and impaired uh, problem-solving capacity. And there are proximal risk factors like uh, life events, separations, uh, development of uh, acute substance misuse, which can lead to, uh, to behavioral disinhibition, which all can lead to suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior. But to make it more complex, and even if this is a simplified schema, there are also population risk factors, which are rapid changes in social structure values, which are marked above. Economic turmoil, which we have seen in, in the economic crisis uh, in Europe, and social isolation. There are also down there environmental factors, access to means, media reports, or poor access to mental health care. So suicide endophenotypes. Uh, the first uh, one which I'm going to talk most about today is uh, uh, here depicted by the painting of Edouard Manet, Le Suicide, showing a young man who has uh, killed himself by shooting. And this uh, endophenotype or phenotype has been mostly studied in relation to serotonin system. But there are, suicides are very different, and the other phenotype which I uh, have studied quite a lot is um, uh, treatment depress uh, resistant depression and um, melancholic depression, uh, which is depicted by Van Hoch's at Eternity's Gate, showing a melancholically depressed older man. Um, and uh, the stress system dysregulation has been shown in this kind of uh, treatment-resistant depressions to play a, an important role. So, is violent method of suicide a behavioral mark of lifetime aggression? This uh, earlier paper, uh, also from Canada, uh, did a psychological autopsy study investigating 310 individuals who had committed suicide, and they found that if they had used a violent method, it was associated with a higher level of lifetime aggression and higher level of impulsivity. And in addition, it was also associated with lifetime substance abuse. This study comes from uh, Sweden, from Karolinska Institute, 
and um, it looks at the suicide attempt method uh, as a risk factor for future suicide. And uh, the control group in this study was uh, uh, individuals who had made a self-poisoning or uh, yeah, tablet intoxication, and they, it was the largest group. It was 40,746 individuals, and that was the reference. And then the authors of this study compared if you had made the first suicide attempt by violent means and survived, and then in the follow-up uh, committed suicide. So the risk was six times higher if you had survived an attempt with hanging, and it was uh, four times higher if you have survived a drowning of, uh, attempt, and uh, three times higher if you had jumped and survived. So this is an important uh, information to take into their suicide risk assessment. You really should uh, ask about uh, methods of earlier suicide attempts because they uh, evince in the long term a higher risk for these patients. We have also quite recently replicated these findings in our population-based uh, cohort where we looked at uh, different methods and uh, risk of future suicide death. And we found that hanging uh, was the method that evinced the highest risk. We tried in this study also to control for early, early risk factors. As I mentioned in the first study, we had information about contact problems and uh, substance abuse, and we had also intelligence levels. But still the hanging was uh, method that uh, led much more often to suicide death if you had survived the first attempt. So this is a population-based study from Finland actually which has looked at childhood bullying behaviors as a risk for suicide attempts and completed suicides. And um, both the childhood exposure to violence and aggressive behavior are considered important risk factors for suicidal behavior. And in this study, uh, the authors found that uh, being a bully or being a victim was associated with higher risk, even though the risks really didn't remain significantly higher if you uh, adjusted for uh, all the confounding factors in both sexes. So, I move to the part of uh, the value of measuring interpersonal violence in suicidal patients. We have uh, published a rating scale, uh, Karolinska Interpersonal Violence Scale, uh, 2010. In, and this scale measures uh, used violence as a child, used violence as an adult, and exposure to violence as a child, and exposure to violence as an adult. And um, the scale was uh, designed by Professor Marie Osberry, and uh, she has also, as you may know, uh, made earlier the Montgomery Osberry Depression Rating Scale. So she designed this scale based on her studies on uh, the role of serotonin, and she thought that it might be of importance to, to assess interpersonal violence in suicide attempters. And the, scales, the scale is constructed this way, that there, there are first questions uh, and short statements about violent behavior, which you can eventually have used as a child or as an adult. And, um, you should use, on the basis of the interview, the highest score where one or more of the statements apply. Here are the examples of the used violence as a child between 60 to 14 years, and as an adult 15 years or older. And then, in the second part, you ask about uh, if you, uh, the patient has been victim of violence in childhood, or in adulthood. And uh, there are examples 
in childhood, if you have been bullied occasionally for a short period, often bullied or bullied throughout childhood, or if you have been, uh, for example, sexually abused, it gives you a score of four. And um, if you have been battered or raped, you in, as an adult, you get a point four, score four. And what we did, we had uh, done this uh, semi-structured interview with uh, a total of 161 suicide attempters. And uh, we had also 95 healthy volunteers, and they were screened to verify, verify the absence of current or past mental disorders. And um, the patients were interviewed, and we uh, then followed up them in the Swedish uh, death register to see which patients had committed suicide during the follow-up. The, these patients were actually uh, recruited between 1993-2005, so we had at least uh, four years follow-up for all of them when we did the analysis. And during the follow-up, there were nine suicides, and the mean follow-up was uh, 9.5 years. And as I mentioned, all patients were followed up at least four years. And there were five suicides within four years. And uh, we presented in the paper this uh, analysis concerning the patients who committed suicide within four years from entering to the study. What we found was that the five patients who committed suicide within four years, they had significantly higher scores of exposure to violence as a child, used violence as an adult, and the total score compared to survivors. We also analyzed the nine suicides and the uh, results were similar. This uh, picture shows uh, uh, the distribution of the two uh, subscales which were significant uh, and predictive for the future suicide in suicide victims and survivors. We, of course, adjusted these results for comorbidity and uh, for substance abuse and personality disorder diagnosis and the findings remained uh, significant. There were also 32 patients who had used a violent suicide attempt method at the baseline, and these patients differed also in their uh, ratings in the Karolinska Interpersonal Violence Scale. They had used more, uh, they had reported more used violent behavior as an adult and lifetime used violent behavior compared to suicide attempters who had used a nonviolent suicide attempt method like tablet intoxication. We have very recently looked at the same scale in a, in a different population of 95 um, alcohol-dependent patients and healthy volunteers. And um, here, the suicidality in these alcohol-dependent patients was assessed with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which is widely used nowadays and translated to the most, of the, most languages. And uh, here you can see that um, Alcohol-dependent patients who had reported a suicide attempt scored higher in uh, interpersonal violence total score, and uh, healthy controls were on the same level as alcohol-dependent patients without suicide attempt. The same was uh, the fact for the suicidal ideation, which was captured with the Columbia scale, and patients with suicidal ideation had higher total interpersonal violence score. And uh, when we looked at the sum scales, so the ideation group had higher uh, exposure scores, they had been more often victims of violence, and uh, they had also uh, used more violence as an adult. So this replicated uh, in some way our findings from the original study about that uh, 
patients who have suicidal behaviors also report higher levels of interpersonal violence. We are actually looking in, uh, in another uh, diagnosis cohort the same. Uh, we have very recently published about HP axis dysregulation in men with hypersexual disorder, and we have information in this group about uh, their suicide attempts and suicide, uh, suicidal ideation. So we're preparing a manuscript, and our preliminary results are that even in this uh, very different uh, patient group, a history of suicidal behaviors is related to uh, uh, higher interpersonal violence. And uh, Columbia suicide severity rating scale also uh, uh, includes uh, questions about aggressive behaviors, uh, behavior toward, towards others and homicidal ideation. We have also looked at the two scales in combination to if the prediction of future suicide uh, could be better and we found that suicide intent scale in this study at least did not correlate with the Karolinska interpersonal violence scale and they both captured different kinds of risks. Finally, uh, concerning the clinical studies, um, we have uh, just uh, finished the first manuscript of uh, a multi-center cohort study where suicide attempters uh, were presenting to the psychiatric emergency department uh, and they were interviewed by using the Karolinska interpersonal violence scale and they were followed up in the medical record review to look at new suicide attempts within six months. We had 355 uh, patients in this study. 63% of them were women. And what we saw that 22% uh, of these suicide attempters repeated a suicide attempt within six months. And 6% uh, of them used a violent method in the repeated attempt. And what we found was that uh, the total, uh, total interpersonal violence score, more, six or more, was associated with the repeated suicide attempt within six months. And uh, there was a threefold increase in odds ratio for repeat attempt using a violent method. As you can see, the odds ratio for the repeated uh, attempt was not so high meaning that you can't only rely on one scale or even two scales in suicide risk assessments. As I mentioned and showed the complexity of the, of the risks, uh, it, this makes it uh, quite uh, demanding and very difficult to use the scales to capture these, uh, these risks, which are also in the timeline different. But, um, uh, in summary, these uh, studies show that uh, it might be of value uh, to ask about interpersonal violence in, in patients who come after attempted suicide because it may, may play a role in their future risk. What about non-suicidal self-injury? This is a new diagnosis in DSM-5 and, uh, and uh, it has been separated from uh, from suicide attempts uh, and uh, people who usually uh, have this kind of behavior of non-suicidal self-injury, they cut themselves, as is made here in the diary, I cut, I cut it to make it better. Uh, we have studied in a group of suicide attempters uh, this phenomenon of NSSI in relation to interpersonal violence. What we saw that uh, suicide attempters who reported both behaviors, they came with a suicide attempt and then they were interviewed uh, concerning non-suicidal self-injury. Many of them reported that they ha also uh, had this uh, NSSI behavior. And uh, those who had this uh, 
non-suicidal self-injury behavior reported more uh, expressed interpersonal, used interpersonal violence as an adult. And it was also related to the choice of a violent suicide attempt method in men, which uh, make it uh, maybe a kind of a marker of a more severe psychopathology in this, in this group. Okay. Uh, last, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go through a little bit about the, the neurobiology of uh, these behaviors. Serotonin uh, has been intensively studied uh, uh, in both in violence and in suicide, and the seminal papers uh, the started from the Karolinska Institute with uh, Professor Mari Osberg, who reported that uh, low cerebrospinal fluid uh, serotonin metabolite uh, 5 HIA uh, was found in violent suicide attempters and in suicide victims. And later, it was also reported in violent offenders, especially from the Finnish studies from Matti Virkkunen. And, uh, here you can see the serotonin metabolis, metabolite, 5-HIAA. Uh, you can measure it in uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and it's uh, thought that it's a kind of a general measure of uh, serotonin activity in the brain. Here are the, the pioneers, uh, Mari Osberg, her first paper in Archives of General Psychiatry, then uh, Lil Treskman Benz, who reported uh, especially the violent attempters having lower levels compared to nonviolent attempters and depressed patients without suicide attempt and healthy controls. And uh, Peter Nordström also uh, showed that uh, it predicted suicide risk after attempted suicide during the first, first year. So. Uh, there is uh, quite a lot of evidence that uh, low levels of CSF5-HIA are related to heightened suicide risk. Uh, and it was also the case in the recent meta-analysis by John Mann, who reported uh, an odds ratio of 4.5 for low 5-HIA and future suicide. Uh, what about uh, the connection between violent behavior. This is the first uh, and very well cited paper from USA from Brown, looking at the aggression and low serotonin metabolite in CSF. He also, he saw negative correlation. This study had a remarkably high effect size of 80%. And um, there are also patients without suicidal behavior and uh, with suicidal behavior. Uh, in a recent meta-analysis by Duke in 2013, uh, reviewing all serotonin studies in violence, the effect sizes for uh, later CSF 5-HIAA studies and uh, violence risk was much lower than in these uh, earlier studies. And, uh, or not all studies have replicated these findings. But in summary, uh, if you look at um, different kind of uh, studies concerning serotonin system, there seems to be a connection. As we can see here in this uh, uh, imaging study from John Mann's group with Maria Quendo uh, as the first author, where they saw prefrontally localized hyperfunction and impaired serotonergic responsivi responsivity, which was proportional to the lethality of the suicide attempt. What about the environment and serotonin system? Uh, there are very nice early studies in racist macaque monkeys with the maternal separation paradigm, which showed that the infants which were permanently separated from their mothers had persistently lower uh, CSF5-HIA levels uh, compared to mother-reared peers, and they showed more impulsive aggressive behavior. We looked at this in the subsample of our suicide attempt cohort 
where we had also um, leak for uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, CSF5HIA measured. And we looked at uh, correlation between uh, interpersonal violence and serotonin metabolite. And what we saw that in women there was a significant negative correlation uh, and um, uh, the lower the lower the CSF5HA, uh, the higher the exposure, self-reported exposure to interpersonal violence as a child was. And um, when we did a median split and we looked at the uh, connection between exposure to uh, violence as a child and used violence as an adult, this called cycle of violence, it was significant in patients who had low CSF5-HIA, but it was not significant in those who had a high level of CSF5-HIA. Meaning that the, uh, this um, emo emotion, emotion dysregulation or aggression disruption behavior is more marked if you have low, low general level of serotonin. There are also uh, Genetic studies of in extreme uh, violent behavior showing MAOA genotype in Finnish uh, prisoners were, which were connected to number of violent crimes. Which uh, is also evidence for serotonin involvement in, in violent behavior. What about cholesterol? Uh, this is an interesting uh, paper uh, looking at uh, a 26-year-old male who was presented with uh, delusions and suicidal behavior. And this patient had 10 paternal male relatives in two prior generations, and five of them died by violent suicide, and one of the five also committed a double homicide. And uh, what they found was that he was hypocholesterolemic due to the uh, being heterozygous for a novel mutation of apolipoprotein B. And uh, there are, of course, many, many other studies concerning the role of cholesterol. But uh, this is uh, quite interesting uh, in a very, very special family. What about other uh, biomarkers? Uh, oxytocin has been also uh, related to life history of aggression. In this study of uh, Emil Kokkaros group, uh, they found that uh, there was a negative correlation between CSF oxytocin and lifetime aggression in uh, uh, persons who had personality disorder. And interestingly, they reported also that they, these um, for individuals who had reported that they had a suicide attempt history, they had a lower levels of CSF oxytocin compared to the others. We have, um, after that, published a study on CSF oxytocin, which was related to high intent in suicide attempters. It tended to be lower in suicide attempters than in healthy controls and it showed a negative correlation with the suicide intent. The more intent, the more you had isolated, not told to anyone about your suicide attempt, the lower the CSF oxytocin levels were. But interestingly, we also looked at in this study the uh, connection, association between uh, lifetime violent behavior. Even if it, uh, it was not significant, it was uh, a trend for significance. But uh, this uh, study had a very, quite small sample size, so um, we could not detect anything else but uh, large effects. Uh, there are many studies uh, on neuroinflammatory markers, and um, they have been uh, studied in suicidal behavior, and. Uh, for example, interleukin-6 has been reported to be higher in uh, CSF compared to, uh, compared to healthy volunteers or uh, 
And um, in this study, the authors uh, from the same group, uh, Emil Kokkaras group, uh, showed a positive correlation between uh, plasma CRP and IL-6. And uh, again, lifetime history of aggression. Uh, my PhD student, uh, Josef Isung, uh, just uh, we published this paper uh, on high interleukin 6 and impulsivity uh, two years ago, uh, where we saw that uh, IL-6 in both in cerebrospinal fluid and in plasma were related to impulsivity and monotony avoidance in suicide attempters. And there was a trend for uh, IL-6 levels in plasma being higher in those suicide attempters who had used a violent suicide attempt method. So, uh, I can recommend this uh, to review articles concerning the neurobiology of aggression and violence and neurobiology of suicide. Uh, if you are more interested in looking at uh, in detail what is the latest uh, research on this? They are quite, quite recent reviews. Uh, I just skip this slide. Uh, lastly, I would like to mention something about uh, uh, early life adversity because it's a very important factor in these studies, as you saw in the risk factors of suicidal behavior, early life adversities very important to assess. And it leads to epigenetic regulation and through dysregulated stress response may be related to different kind of development of psychopathology and suicidal behavior. So, in summary, uh, there is a link between suicidal and violent behaviors and uh, based on our research, I would say that it is of value to ask about violent behaviors in suicide risk assessments. And there are some degree overlapping neurobiological systems involved in both behaviors. <laughs> Ich stehe